Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us once again across the Louisiana Plain, where we are advancing the cause of constitutional freedom and liberty, raising the profile of great constitutional conservative candidates across the state of Louisiana, and day by day, steadily, relentlessly, inexorably, and courageously draining the Louisiana swamp. My name is Chris. And I'm Danielle, and this is the State of Freedom, brought to you by freedom-loving Louisiana First Patriots. Hello, State of Freedom Warriors. Thank you so much for inviting us to be part of your day. We are so grateful for you. You are the best of the best, the cream of the crop, the best listening family anyone could possibly hope for. And you know that we're only here because of your encouragement, your prayers, your friendship, your financial support. And if you are looking for a way to support us, to advertise with us, or to send us feedback, please do that at freedomstate.us. We would also love it if you would help us get the word out about the state of freedom and help spread the reach. Please like the show on whatever platform you listen to us, subscribe to it and share it. You can share short clips instead of the whole interview or whole episode over on our YouTube and Rumble channels and links to those, as you know, are always in the show notes and over on freedomstate.us. Moms for Liberty East Baton Rouge Paris Chapter is dedicated to fighting for the survival of America by unifying, educating, and empowering parents to defend and take back their parental rights at all levels of government. To learn more or to get involved with Moms for Liberty East Baton Rouge, email momsforlibertybatonrouge at gmail.com. That's moms, the number four, libertybatonrouge at gmail.com. The email address is on the Patriot page of our website, freedomstate.us, and it's in the show notes. We are so happy to have back on Senator Heather Cloud from District 28 will be joining us just in a second. Before we bring her in, let me read the scripture of the day. It's Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 10, and it says, When Jesus entered the village of Capernaum, a man in the Roman army approached him asking for a miracle. Lord, he said, I have a son who's lying in my home paralyzed and suffering terribly. Jesus responded, I will go with you and heal him. But the Roman officer interjected, Lord, who am I to have you come into my house? I understand your authority, for I too am a man who walks under authority and have authority over soldiers who serve under me. I can tell one to go and he'll go and another to come and he'll come. I command my servants and they'll do whatever I ask. So I know that all you need to do is to stand here and command healing over my son, and he will be instantly healed. Jesus was astonished when he heard this and said to those who were following him, he has greater faith than anyone I've encountered in Israel. As I was reading this, I just thought this is a stunning example of how powerful the words of Jesus are. He walked in a level of power and authority that caused sickness death and demons to flee, and he has delegated that power to us, his co-heirs, through his death and resurrection. So let this passage encourage you to boldly use the words of the Lord, the words of scripture, to be part of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. We pray as part of the Lord's prayer, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we should pray that way as Jesus taught. But we are also commanded to be part of making that happen. How is his kingdom expanded on earth? It's expanded when we lay our lives down, forsaking the earthly kingdom that we were born into and receive citizenship in the kingdom of God as his children through repentance and belief in Jesus. How is his will done on earth? Well, it's done if we follow his example and his instruction. And if we follow the example of the centurion, two things strike me about the passage, Danielle. The first thing that strikes me is the centurion's faith, his faith, which was so strong and so powerful and so simple. And also what strikes me is his own unworthiness. I'm not even worthy that you should come under my roof, but if you will it, it will be done. And so it's just a reminder that it's not because of our worthiness or our merit that we get anything. It's only because of the blood and the sacrifice of of Jesus. And that is one of my favorites. Interesting, that's one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and I just absolutely love it. As you mentioned in the outset, we have uh, Senator Heather Cloud, who's been on the show before. 
to talk about a bill today, and uh, we're so happy that you can visit with us for a few minutes. Senator Cloud, how are you today? Oh, friends, I am good, even better, thinking through the story of the centurion. We're going through a, a time, um, a series in our church called Insignificant, and it's all these people. We don't know the name of the centurion, right, in, in the Bible. Mm-hmm. We don't know his name and so many others, we don't know their name, but their actions had such, such a significant place in our faith walk. And it, it has ripple effects into today. And to know that that power and that authority that Jesus left, when he left, he said he had to go. And then one would come that would give us that authority through the Holy Spirit to walk in that authority, to help the sick, heal the sick, heal the blind. There's so much authority that we have at our fingertips. If we just would figure out how to tap into it, it's right there. So thank you for that. You're so right. It is so, so true, you know, just figuring out how to tap into it. And really, I think at the foundation of it, uh, Heather and Danielle, it's all really grace. Nothing is really earned. It's all the gift of His grace, and that is what we have to remember. The moment we start thinking that we're earning things or we we, that we warrant or deserve things is kind of when we start to get off track, because then our ego comes into play, Uh, and then we start thinking we're doing everything instead of, uh, and we take our focus off God, but absolutely. And we lose our anointing. We lose our anointing at that point, Chris. Yes. Yes, yeah. we have to stay on our knees and, and stay humble. Speaking of the uh, your your bill SB 482, which is your your public records bill that you, that you're bringing, um, it's there's been some controversy about this. Woo! I don't know how much of it is is necessarily warranted. I had a chance to read uh, Heather the Sierra U.S. Supreme Court decision, and it looks like the language of the amendment to which people are objecting is pretty much straight out of the U.S. Supreme Court Sierra decision. Talk to us a little bit about what your public records bill is going to do and how it's going to play out. Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone that is concerned about the bill because that means they're paying attention to government and they don't want government to go in a direction that could impede transparency and their ability to to call government into check. And so I thank them and I'm glad, I'm I'm actually glad these things are happening right now and that people are paying attention. I do, so I'm going to start by saying the bill language is is kind of what we're working through right now. The left media, uh, the the left progressives, they want us to do nothing, basically. They want to use public records and any other opportunity to create chaos and bog down government. And they're doing it across the country. And they're, they're asking for things that are pre-decisional, that are just conversations, maybe by text or email, from a superior to a staff member or a staff members asking for advice and or in pre-decisional uh, drafts, like as in the case that I, I had sent you, the Sierra Club versus the U.S. Wildlife and Fisheries. And that's a great case to start off with because, you know, in reading that case, you'll see that there was the Sierra Club, which is an environmental activist group. They want to protect everything. I and mean, there's a place for them. But there was a species species of fish that they thought could be in danger, endangered species that could be flowing through the water that was being used to cool a system. I'm not sure if it was an electrical generation system or it, what the system was. Well, they were suing the wildlife and fisheries over that species of fish. And so the wildlife and fisheries started working with another U.S. services agency they, and they were investigating it and they put together someone at the lower level in one of the agencies put together a draft. And the draft said, this is our stand on this issue and we're gonna do X, Y, and Z. And so they sent the draft up to their superiors. It was exchanged between the agencies. They said, don't do anything. They deliberated on it, thought, talked about it. And they said, no, we're not gonna go in that direction. We don't think that, we think that's premature. We need to study this. So they instituted a study for a year from 2013 to 2014. They studied the situation to see if there was actually a problem because I don't know where that system was, but it could shutting down a cooling system for whatever plant that was could have had pretty significant community effects, you know, the surrounding areas. And so they did a study. Well, at the conclusion of that study, they found that there was no 
potential for harm and that they didn't need to shut down the facility or, or take any mitigation measures. And so they put together an actual draft that says, uh, or an actual document that says, after studying the issues, and here's, here's our, you know, here's our ruling, we're not going to basically do anything. And so they issued that draft. Well, the Sierra Club was still mad because they didn't get what they wanted. They wanted to shut the thing down. And so they sued wanting the, the draft. Well, the draft was contrary to the final product. I mean, it was complete different direction. And, and the government said, well, you don't need the draft because that's not the direction that we, we went. And to put that draft out would miscommunicate information to the public and cause confusion. Well, they, they sued through the district court and probably a liberal do- court probably said, yeah, they can have the draft. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. They went to a, a circuit court. The circuit court said, they can have the draft. It's not a big deal. But they're going to publish that draft. And finally, they went all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, with it, trying to protect that draft the the federal government did. And in the Amy, Amy Coney Barrett and Wallace and all the justices ended up dissenting. And they basically said, what I said, which is that is pre-decisional, that was before a study, that has no bearing on the final outcome, and to put that out, it would misinform the public and cause confusion because there would be two different, basically, products out there. And so they determined in favor of the federal government. That's what we're talking about right now. We're talking about drafts. We're talking about email correspondence within government where they're trying to make a decision on what to do. And we have different agency, these different groups like li- liberal organizations that want to get all of the information that has no bearing on anything. And they're going to use it to try to defame people, bog down the government and uh, cause embarrassment. Right. That and that's what it that's what it sounds like, Senator Cloud. Let, let me ask you this. What, uh, in line with what you're saying, what about pre-decisional communications, deliber- uh, communications and, and recommendations that are consistent with the final product, that are consistent with the, with the final decision? Well, in, in the case that I talked about, you know, all those studies, all of that evidence would be public record that would never be hidden from the, from the public. And I've read through the cases any product that would be part of litigation as well. In anything that would be part of litigation, we may add that to my bill, you know, that that wouldn't be able to be withheld either. But they've consistently said that even if a draft is in line and consistent with the final product, it's still a draft. And, you know, there's there's a question of where do we draw the line? Like, let's just leave the pre decisional drafts out of play. Now, let me also say that in the law and in the bill that I'm working on and we're trying to fix the language on, after eight years, when, for example, the governor is gone, all that pre-decisional stuff would become public record that would be archived. So it, it eventually, you'd be able to look at the historical of how something actually happened and, and see the history behind it. But in the heat of it, when everything is so very polarized, we don't want those documents to be used to misinterpret, you know, the actual operations of that government. That's really helpful. In terms of, so you've mentioned the pre-decisional piece of it. Would you mind just for our listeners explaining what the full scope of this public records bill would be protecting? Well, right right now, and the attorney general, when the attorney general was, the governor was the attorney general, Jeff Landry told me when I first became a senator, because I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I wanted my bills to start out perfect, right? And he had to tell me, Heather, no bill starts out perfect. It's like making sausage. I may have told you this before. It starts out, everybody starts speaking into the issue. You hear both sides and then the final product looks different than just like we're talking about with public records. The final product of the bill often looks diff- much different and, and different at the very least than how it started. And that's what we're talking about right now in committee. You were there, Chris. You, Scott Steinberg and many others that were there, Scott said, look, he said there needs to be a definition in statute of the deliberative process privilege. He said, we, we really need to define it. He said, 
the how is what we're talking about right now. Like, how do we define it without doing any harm? And so in my bill right now, it talks about records, advisory opinions, recommendations, and deliberations comprising part of a process by which government decisions and policies are formulated. We look at that and we look, we look at, okay, these are opinions and pre-decisional documents and opinions and recommendations. I gave in the committee, I gave a good example of Kate Kelly. She is, she works for the governor. She's his press secretary. She does his media. And if she puts together a draft and she sends it up to the governor and she says, I prepared this draft for you, this press release on this issue, please give me your stamp of approval and I'll put it out. And he reads it, or maybe his chief of staff, he reads it. And he said, no, Kate, that's not what we, we meant. You know, we, we don't want to put that out. We need to change X, Y, and Z. Or Kate, circumstances have changed tremendously since you drafted that. We're not, we're not even going to deal with that issue. And so she says, okay. And she just like voids her draft. Well, right now that draft and that correspondence with Kate Kelly would be subject to public records, could be subject to public records. So, but Senator Cloud, but, but I, but I got to ask you really quick. So back to my original question, but what if the governor's response had been, I agree with it, this is consistent and will help us form the basis for our final decision. Would, would her communication at that point be subject to public records or is it only if it's inconsistent with the final product because i understand your point that you're making about the sierra club they're asking for all this stuff for two reasons to bog down government agencies and to embarrass government agencies oh you said this over here you don't know what you're talking about y'all are inconsistent in your public pronouncement i know exactly what you're saying but my point is if it's consistent all the way through would everything still nonetheless be exempt from public disclosure yeah i don't think that we're trying to prescribe that whether they put their, their, if it is consistent with the, the outcome, and I need to read some of the court cases because they talk about that. A draft is a draft is a draft, and I've seen that over and over in, in the court case, but I need to go back and reflect on it a little bit, and I, I think I just go back to what does it really matter if, if that draft fell, falls in line with the, the outcome or whether it doesn't, it's still pre-decisional. Right. I don't know that it's even necessary yeah. for it to be public. So under the bill, so so Senator Cloud, so under your bill, just just to be clear, really the only thing that would be subject to a, a viable public records request would be the final policy position, the final decision of a government agency. Yeah, and any any of the studies and documentation that would you know that would be used for that final decision that wouldn't be precluded. That or at least we're trying not to preclude that from it. So like, we're still working on that language. And let me give you another, you asked me this question last week when we were on the phone, Chris. You said, what about advisory opinions? Why do you need to include advisory opinions? Shouldn't we see advisory opinions? Well, I went back this morning and I watched the committee hearing where Mr. Tom Jones that works for the Attorney General this is another really good example. He said, he's one of her executive staff members, uh, lawyer. He said that what they do is issue advisory opinions from the attorney. That's people write to them and they issue advisory opinions from the attorney general to the, to the general public and to other government agencies, you know, political subdivisions. He said, this often happens. He said he'll have a lower level attorney that drafts an advisory opinion on an issue and that lower level attorney sends it up to, to the chain and it may hit Mr. Tom Jones's desk. He reads the opinion and he's trying to train up his staff there. And so he sends a memo back down to her and he says, you know, something to the effect of being a devil's advocate. Well, what if this was the case or what if that was the case? Um, have you considered have you considered this happening? And so he said then she may be able to back up that you know her stand or she may have to go a complete different direction and he said he's getting to the point where he's afraid to even send the memo saying you're trying to teach his staff how to reflect um, and analyze their advisory opinions 
because they could become public record and be misconstrued when it's not a final advisory opinion. And, and Senator Cloud, I can really appreciate that because even as you were talking before this example, I was thinking I've done some hard time, like several years hard labor as an intern <laughs> when I was coming up in government. And I mean, there were a couple rules, you know, one was you, the Washington Post test. You, you absolutely can only send something over email that you would not be embarrassed of if it were to hit the front page of the Washington Post. And then the second one, well, just I guess the second piece of that was, you know, if there's something coming that maybe is not the most burning issue or there's some lag time on it, you know, lead time on it, they will give it to even interns to start sketching out like what are, you know, what are the main issues that are pertaining to this? And so I don't know that you necessarily want a 19 year old's musings about whatever that may or may not finally make it into a final decision as piece of that. So I, I can respect that and understand that for sure. Thank you, Danielle. And that's, this, that is truly what the bill is meant to do, is to protect that process. I think in that U.S. Supreme Court case, you know, I think it, it was Amy Barrett, Coney Barrett, that said, you know, governments need the ability w to deliberate with unfettered access to, to be able to truly deliberate to make the best decision for their constituency and, and have the best outcomes, of course. That is what where we're going with this bill. And at the same time, we want to be very careful. And I think that's what you know people are looking at and they're hearing from the, the, li the liberal media is really jumping on this bandwagon because this is part of what they're doing right now. It is their master plan to try to, you know, to hurt government and usher in socialism. I truly believe that. Yeah. But at the same time, there, you know, I have fought to protect, you know, our our the innocence of our children in libraries, and we want those those library boards and some of these local rogue organizations, all the commission, all the way down to the very the very smallest level. I don't want to empower them in any way, or local governments, towns, or parishes to empower them to try to hide behind this deliberative process definition too. So I'm walking a very fine line of trying to fix a very real problem and not hurt or create another problem. It is very difficult. Of course, you see all the headlines of rising above it and trying to, to make the best decisions because that's what people elected me to do, to make the best decisions. It's taken me a minute and it's a little bit messy, like, like uh, Governor Landry says, making sausage is messy. But that final product usually comes out pretty doggone good. And that's what we're looking for is that good final product. And we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. You'll get there. But question, Senator Cloud, the humble suggestion that, that I would make regarding your legislation is this. Let's say we had a, a governor who we suspect who and we wanted to make sure as conservatives that we had broad access to his decision making process, broad access to information that we thought we needed to know because he was implementing horrible policy. We wanted to know how he came about this policy, whether he was being influenced in a way that was corruptive or inclined toward corruption. Let's just say we were the ones seeking the information. And as you draft and finalize your bill, I would just suggest that you put yourself in the position of us being on the outside and seeking documentation that we find important from an administration that we totally disagree with, which is not the case, and see you know where we would be in that situation. And just kind of consider that as you're moving along, because I, I know that you are walking a very fine balance here, uh, and I appreciate your statement that you do not want to create any kind of cover for a corrupt library board so they can hide their misdeeds. I completely appreciate that. But just kind of consider the perspective if we were the ones on the outside trying to get documents from a government agency and consider that in your bill as well. Absolutely. I'm a citizen, too, and I'll be on the other side in a, you know, a few short years. I'll, I'll be back on the other side, I'm sure. And I want to protect my ability, too, to, to be able to investigate government. And we can't forget that it doesn't stop at the statute. If you're being denied access to records that you actually need 
to have and you pursue that, you know, eight groups pursue that legally, the courts ultimately will decide and they will look at the record and, and what what context the communication, the text and the emails, I've read that through jurisprudence, what context that communication falls in and then they'll determine whether it was substantial or not in making that decision and the court may very well then grant that public records request. So yeah. you, just because we pass the statute doesn't mean we are truly trying to codify what these court cases have said and, and say something about recognizing the deliberative process privilege in our statutes. I mean, we need yeah. to do that. The courts have repeatedly ruled in, in, in favor of protecting deliberation. But at the end of the day, the statute, too, doesn't – well, a well-written statute isn't going to – isn't going to prevent you from being able to seek legal remedy. Yeah. Well, That's th- right. And thank you for walking that tightrope because the the I know you have transparency on one side and deliberation on the other side. And so it is a razor's edge for you to walk on. And I appreciate your willingness to try and do that and and find the best outcome. I'm excited to share a fantastic opportunity for State of Freedom listeners who are interested in investing in precious metals or even starting a home-based business in the precious metals industry. Metal Stacks is a precious metals collector's club where you can buy your metals at the best prices on the market, actual dealer cost. They are beating the big sites. They have no credit card fees and no minimums. If you're just interested in purchasing metals at a great price, visit metalstacks.com forward slash dwalker. Get to shopping, that helps me out. I get the commission. You can also refer people to Metal Stacks for an additional income. If you're interested in learning about the referral business aspect of Metal Stacks, email me directly at danielle at freedomstate.us for more information. Uh, Heather, quick question, and Danielle, I apologize if you were about to ask this, but I, but I want to ask you, Heather, what about the possibility of, I know you said after eight years, all the deliberations would, would at that point become public. What about allowing the deliberations to become public after a final agency decision is made and promulgated? Well, I think what Danielle said about some of the um, – I'm not I'm not against it. I mean, the eight years is what's already in law and the federal government goes by 25 years. Um, that's what they they allow is 25 years. But I think that there's still it brings me back to what Danielle said. You know, when you have the musings of an intern or a new staff member that is communicating via text, email, et cetera, you still don't want certain things just don't need to be published they have no bearing and they're embarrassing you know for for new staff members and in, in the discovery process and, and in, in the learning curve yeah i get that I, I don't it's just all very difficult everything is that if then if this happens then this could happen so i mean i'm working through it what the things that you just said to me chris i'm going to think through them i promise I'm oh, I know you will. You always you always do. And and I know that you do. You are very sensitive to the fact that we are a government of, by and for the people. And I know that anything that may need to be clarified or or in your bill, you will do so. Because, again, I, I know that, you know, the government is accountable to us. So so thank you for your hard work on the bill. Oh, it, this was it's the hardest one. And I, I sure didn't expect. I don't know. I, I didn't expect it to be this hard, but I tell you what, it's challenging my thinking. It's, uh, you know, educating me in ways that exploring things I haven't explored before. I'm reading federal court cases, all kinds of state court cases. And so it's expanding my thinking and um, we'll see where it goes. I just believe in the name of Jesus, we're going to end up in a good place that everybody can coalesce. Will we make the very left, left, left and the very right, 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 super happy? Probably not. But hopefully we can land somewhere that we can all swallow it and while acknowledging that this is a problem, we do need to address it and we're going to just try to address it in the best way possible. Yeah. Well, before we let you go, I do want to talk about one other thing that you have been deeply involved in that is hopefully much less contentious and fraught than this, which is you've been working with Pastor James Buntrock, who we had on the show sometime toward the end of last year. 
He's from My God Votes, and you are helping to get pastors to the legislature to lead a service once a week during session. How is that going? How did you get involved? Well, um, I think maybe you had a little bit of bearing on it. I, I'm not sure. They are associated. The church that Pastor Butt Rock goes to is associated with my chief of staff's church in Alexandria, which is the area that I'm from. So God just has a way of, of weaving people together. And I think this is one of those. They contacted David Allen that works with me. David mentioned it to me and pressed me a couple of times to meet with James Butrock. And actually, it was my husband and David that works for me, and James had lunch one day here, drove from Houston to Evangelion Parish, and we just saw, he expressed to us he was an engineer, he's a civil engineer working in the private, you know, private field, and the Lord put this on his heart to start getting more involved in government and bringing people, pastors, the church out of the four walls and involved in the government. And so he started doing that in Texas. He effectively did it successfully. There's a, a huge involvement there. And then he thought he was finished and the Lord put it on it. He said, you're not finished. You just got started. This is his story. I'm telling it for him. <laughs> and so he said, you know, plan to go further. So he went next door to Oklahoma, worked with legislators there and pastors and they're not trying to operate in our God votes from Texas. They want every state to have a solid association of pastors and believers that are marching in into the capital and bringing the spirit of God in there. And I can tell you, sometimes it's hard for me to get to their, their they're having worship services and preaching, like they have a church That's in awesome. the capital. Um, wow. It's hard for me to always get there, but I went last Tuesday night and we were dealing with some very contentious things. I mean, I had this bill. This is a hard one for me, you know. I mean, I'm balancing my belief system and I'm testing, I'm testing, I'm being tested in a lot of a lot of ways. When I tell you I walked from an embattled atmosphere in the Capitol, it's it's heavy. It's heavy. I walked from that atmosphere and walked into the room where they were having church. It was like the air was different. It was amazing. It was reviving. The air was different. You could just feel it. It's like you went for some from something that was thick and heavy and hard, and you walk in and it's light and fluffy and just joyful and peaceable and every everything good. And I've walked out of there re-energized and refocused and gosh we need that because being a lawmaker it, it's not easy i mean what we're doing is not easy it's tough on our families it's tough on us and you know our heart i can speak for for most of us the ones that i know we're really looking to do good for people we really yeah. are i believe that i believe that's true danielle and i believe that there are that doesn't describe all of you but it describes many of you and it certainly describes you and we are very very proud of that fact well oh, thank you so much for taking a little time to be with us here today heather you are a uh, a great legislator and uh, always receptive to the people's concerns we look forward to continue to following the legislation and quite frankly uh, i just want to end on this note you know the people who are seeking all of the uh, of this documentation, everything under the sun, you're right. They're not seeking it because they are concerned about government accountability. They're seeking it in order to bog down government agencies. They're seeking it in order to embarrass conservatives. They're seeking it really in some ways in order to destroy people and their lives. And, and that is the sinister nature of some of these movements. So I not all of them are, it. Chris. Not all, no. but some of them are. And what we're trying to do is make a determination between the frivolous, abusive requests. We're trying to, and that's what the legislation is trying to do, is make a determination between those that are abusing this for nefarious purposes and those that are just trying to get access for good government. And and that's what that's what this legislation is meant to do is be able to be able to help discern between the two. Yeah. You know who would be a great person to use as a sounding board if if he's got an available phone line is Tom Fitton from Judicial Watch because he does these things all the time and could probably 
very, very well speak to the issue of what would be frivolous versus what he needs access to. Absolutely. Well, send me his contact and know. <laughs> I'll see if I can. We, I'll see if I can yeah, find it. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We'll see if we can locate it. I'll check the Rolodex for you, Cloud. Uh, but, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, that is a great thought, though, Danielle. Well, anyway, God bless you, Heather. Have a great afternoon, and we will see you soon, probably down there in those hallowed halls. Yes, I'd be happy to see some friendly faces. Thank you see so you much. See you guys later. Have a lovely day. You too. God bless you. Bye-bye. Well, Chris, you have to love Senator Cloud. She she really is threading a tough needle today but and this session with that bill, but you can tell that she's in it for the right reasons. She's in it for the right reasons. I think she's trying to balance, as you said, transparency versus the ability to deliberate in candor. And it is a very, very tight line to walk. So, and I'm, I'm glad that she's open to continuing to look at the bill before it gets to the governor's desk and, and doing everything she can to make it a, a very good final product. Yeah. Because it, we, we, you know, obviously we need, we, we, we need both. We need both transparency and we need the ability to deliberate candidly without knowing that it's going to be on the front page of a newspaper the next day. Yeah. Or without needing teams of staff to be able to respond to public records requests. Yeah. That's so sinister that, that, that they're doing that. It is. But your point, I think, was very good that this has to be able to cut both ways. And there are days when we need access to information when we're on the, you know, on the minority side. So I think, you know, I I appreciate that you brought that up. And I think that she will take that point very seriously as well. Me too. Yeah, me too. Well, look, uh, I want to thank all of our State of Freedom supporters, all of our LeCag supporters. Keep supporting us. Keep reaching out and probably going to be testifying here shortly on a, another bill that we'll be able to talk about in due course, Danielle. Great. Uh, but until then... Wait, until then, until forward. then, please uh, check out the Action Center. And if you want to take oh, action yeah. on this bill, you can do that. This is Senate Bill 482. It's a public records bill. So if you want to make sure that we are protecting our executive branch and and I, it seems like it's the executive branch, Chris. Is it the is it the legislature too? It's just the executive branch. This this pertains to the governor. Yeah, just the governor's office from insane uh, deluge of public records requests, and while also retaining the transparent process that the people deserve. Go and make your voice heard at the Action Center. That's lacag.org forward slash action Action Center. Absolutely, make it make it known. Also, go on and join Lacag. L-A-C-A-G dot org. Continue to share the state of freedom available on all major platforms. And if you do and continue to get the word out and continue to support us, Danielle, we will, just like we are doing today, each and every day, take another step to preserve the great state of freedom in Louisiana. Amen. Thanks, Chris. Good luck out there. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The State of Freedom. To stay on top of all the calls to action we mentioned today, just check out the show notes for the episode. If you'd like to support the show financially, visit our website at freedomstate.us. If you'd prefer to give by mail, you can send a check to The State of Freedom, LLC, at P.O. Box 861, Berg, Louisiana, 70343. If you own a business in Louisiana and are interested in supporting our show by advertising, please email us at info at freedomstate.us. To get involved with Louisiana Citizen Advocacy Group, visit lacag.org, L-A-C-A-G dot org, or email chris at chris at lacag.org. If you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe and share it. Give us a five-star rating in the reviews. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.